is our country at this moment heading in a direction where it is discovering its true identity an identity which had been subsumed under colonial rule and an artificial identity sought to be enforced over it or is our country actually headed in a very dangerous direction where priorities are far diversed from what they should be is this good is this bad to talk about the dynamics of the bharat india debate that's at play we've got two formidable thinkers here for the next session at the india today conclave allow me to introduce r jagannathan editorial director at swarajya pavan verma former diplomat renowned author great thinker thank you very much for joining us i want to start by getting pavan verma to explain what is it that concerns you the most one the idea that the india under nehru was an india which was very different from the true self of our nation a far more cosmopolitan western construct of what our country should be in the eyes of some and the prime minister and the supporters of the bjp in the rss would argue that prime minister modi is helping our country discover its culture its history which is what everyone sitting here watching on tv should know rather than be running away from that nehru was running away from the real bharat modi is helping people embrace the real bharat let me say rahul that unlike the current uh, attempt by some to denigrate nehru i believe that india or bharat was extremely fortunate to have a man like him for 17 years at the helm of our country just after we became independent because he did have failings but he being a democrat he being inclusive and he believing in parliamentary democracy ensured that india was one of the few countries who came out of colonization and remained a democracy having said that i think there is some merit in the fact that pandit nehru saw the future of india largely as a break away from what he considered to be a sterile past by that i mean as he writes in his own words we have to get rid of the dead wood of the past which he largely conflated with superstition prejudice and ritual but as i have written in several of my books including the great hindu civilization there was a great deal to be rediscovered of that civilization and that process as often happens in colonized countries did not happen to the sufficient degree and are not even part of our educational curriculum so while his notion of an inclusive and democratic india was important he saw the future largely in the paradigm of western modern modernity and the exclusion of our remarkable civilizational past that is true the danger is and i will elaborate on this future that in recovering or reclaiming that past we have to be aware of pitfalls while being open to making that discovery so before jaggi responds lay out what you see as the pitfalls and the dangers which you think the government of the day needs to be wary of as it seeks to reclaim the past see rahul let's be clear about one thing india was one of the most ancient civilization with the self consciousness of it being a civilization it's a young nation and while that unity is the bedrock of who we are today that unity survives on the survival of diversity if you convert this civilizational unity through political means into a monolithic conformity imposed to strengthen a artificial unity you are going to create problems in preserving that unity and therefore i believe that the one danger is when you say only one language when you say only one name for a country when our multifaceted history or inheritance 
shows that both names are acceptable by now and have so been validated in the constitution. So when you try to impose that monolith, when you say that our interpretation of Hinduism is the only right one and anyone else's is not Hinduism, when you say that this is a country only of people of one faith, but is not a country which has survived over the millennia by being happily multi-plural, multicultural, multilingual, plural, and yet preserving its unity. Those are the dangers. So let Jaggi now respond to this, that there is no one uniform idea of India. There is no one Hindutva to which every person sitting here watching on television or social media must subscribe to. The fear in the path that we are going down is that one man, one idea, one language, one notion, one Hindutva, this is not what India is. And therefore, Nehru, for all his faults and failings, still provided a more multicultural, multi-plural idea, and it is an idea worth preserving and not just going down this road without having the kind of debate where we are, we, we are imagining we are heading into Amritkal, we could end up in a very dark space instead. No, one thing you tend to give Nehru the wrong credit for the wrong reason. He was an Indian who was looking at India from the outside in. We are now trying to look at India from the inside out. We are trying to discover who we are as a people, reconnecting with the past, reconnecting who we are as a people, that is very central. So Nehru wrote, for example, the discovery of India. Why did an Indian need to discover India? I don't know. Under the current uh, last 20, 25 years from Vajpayee and down to Modi, what we are trying to see is the rediscovery of Bharat. And what I mean by that is that we are now trying to come to terms with who we are, what is our uh, heritage, and what and we need to look outside from the point of view of who we are, that we stay rooted and look out. We are doing what is called a Purva Paksha. We are looking at the world with different eyes through our eyes instead of the Westerners' eyes to look in it. This is where the India versus Bharat controversy is very important, but it highlights two ways of looking at you. I, uh, at the outset, I must say, I think this nation benefits by having both the name India and Bharat. For the simple reason that we should use whichever is opportunistically useful for us. When the outside world sees us as India, we should use it for them because we have to conquer the world in terms of uh, trade, whatever it is. But internally, for our own sense of who we are, the idea of Bharat is far more important. So I think it's very important. If you look at our political parties, uh, some, a subliminal difference exists between parties that look for inspiration outside and the parties that have largely looked for inspiration inside. Just look at it. You have an Indian National Congress. All the parties that have looked outside for inspiration have India in the name. Indian National Congress is one of them, started by a British ornithologist. Then you have the various, um, what I call, the communist parties. Their inspiration is Marxism, which came from outside. You have CPI, Communist Party of India, CPI, ML, CPLO. Then you looked at even, say, some of the communal parties like IUML. You have India in them. Their inspiration is the Umma and other things, right? And if you look at the one more, even say Ambedkar's Republican Party, it has India in them. But all other parties, even parties that have left the Congress, do not have India in their names. What does this mean? It means subliminally, we are separating the idea of India from Bharat. The parties that left the Congress do not have India in the name. Trinamool Congress, Nationalist Congress Party, or uh, Telugu Desam, all of them. But all the others actually have RLD, RJD, none of them have India in their names, okay? So what I'm trying to say is, parties that have looked outside in, or wanted to look more outside than in, have India in their names. Parties that have looked in and now want to look inside out are actually the ones with Bharat. So Bharat is what is our natural rhythm, our sense of self. There is a rediscovery of Bharat that's happening. It is a transitional phase. I think worries about Hindutva and whether it will become a malignant force is a different issue. That we can come to separate. But this is about rediscovering our cultural sense of who we are. But and without knowing who we are, you will never be able to progress in the world, Bhavan let me Bhavan tell Bhavan, you. Is this not correct? That those who are sitting here and are above a certain age grew up at a time when, you know, Western values or culture were more sought after. The Indians who are growing up now, these young adults, are actively seeking out their culture, their history, much more than in the past, and that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing 
but i am inherently against while i rarely disagree with jagannathan ji i am basically against the drawing of black and white polarities now to assume that india stands for what is in some respects external to india and bharat is originally the name of india ignores history where did india come from it came from the word sindhu which stands for the indus sindhu is the word that occurs in our vedas and the many variants of sindhu became for the greeks india for the the chinese it became shintu for the persians it became hindu and so on and so forth and gradually the name that is derived which is india is actually not an external imposition there are countries where it was imposed let me give you two or three quick examples you have sri lanka which replaced a british name ceylon in 1972 you had burma which was a british colonizing name replaced by myanmar you had rhodesia rhodesia again a colonial name which was replaced by But namibia is the way the greeks or the persians referred to our country so therefore it is the exonym the name given by outsiders to india the endonym the name given by us to ourselves is bharat very true bharat also has an ancient lineage but the word india is not only how the world saw us but how we also identified ourselves as the culture and people who existed as a civilization south of the sindhu river the indus so what i am trying to but say but the name was an external imposition was, uh, no, no history says the name was an external imposition no 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 it's not an imposition okay external construct and over the a period of time india became synonymous with bharat that is why article 1 of the constitution and by the way the constituent assembly which is a remarkable created a remarkable document called this constitution which is a role model for enlightened compromises without taking hard line and brittle sense on any particular issue where there could be reconciliation this is a very important point entitled yeah. enlightened compromises in the manner in which this country and government are being run right now this enlightened compromises is completely out of the dictionary and you spoke of brittle hard choices foisting your opinion down do you concede that that is true that there is too much of my way or the highway fall in line or else whereas India is really an amalgam of different streams that flow all at the same time without any one stream trying to disrupt the other rather than just one stream and this is the way it will be no i think it's a transitional phase when you are trying to shift the needle a bit away from an elitist um uh, self-hating self-loathing civilization to something that accepts a large part of the good parts of your heritage even while admitting there are problem there will be some shift because you are making a shift from the way of thinking from the left liberal consensus that india was never a real uh, entity it was created by the british this is the narrative we've been told and our elites accepted it throughout the last 60 years now when you want to make a shift you have to do uh, first make a very emphatic shift and then you come to a moderate position that is what i think is happening you are caught history at the time point when Once it is you made changing. an extreme emphatic shift is there space then for moderation later like pendulums it always moves to one extreme before it moves back to the center i want to make one more point you know the uh, 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 sorry uh, the problem here is uh, when we talk about indian war i don't think there is any conflict we are both talking about the same thing right but a name given from outside like we all, i am sure 99% of the people here have names given by somebody else so there is no problem in accepting that the issue is we are confusing a name given and a cultural identity those are not two uh, the same thing india is not bharat for the same reason that bharat is a 
our self-created sense of identity, whereas India is a geographical construct. I want to build on the idea of a pendulum, that from the left, the pendulum is shifting to the extreme right. Ultimately, the pendulum settles in the center. That's Jaggi's point of view. The fear, though, could be as it shifts from the left, it stays on the right, doesn't necessarily moderate and come to the center. You see, first of all, I don't think that there is a need for such a dramatic swing of the pendulum. We are a nation in evolution. There are correctives. I think we need to reclaim much more of our culture and have the knowledge about it. Yes. When I wrote the book Adi Shankaracharya, Hinduism's greatest thinker, many of my friends, well educated, did not know when he was born, what his contribution was. We have read Shakespeare, but we have never read Kalidas. I mean, we don't know who Thiruval Thiruvalluvur is. So, I mean, there are I'm random examples, but there's so much of this. It was a great an ancient civilization which was marked by refinement, continuity, antiquity, assimilation, and it has survived over millennia, and we need to know more about. Having said that, when you say that only one label is the choice to reclaim that civilization, let me give you a controversial example. Let's take Sanatan Dharma. I emphatically condemn the language used by Udayanidhi Stalin and others of his party to denigrate it. At the same time, now this is Hinduism. This is the greatness of Hinduism. It's conquering eclecticism. Hinduism has never burnt anyone on the stake for blasphemy. But there have been different interpretations of Hinduism. The Charvak school in Hindu philosophy, which is a materialistic school, said the Vedas are a bunch of lies. It remains a part of Hinduism. So now what is Sanatan Dharma? If you define Sanatan Dharma largely as, for instance, the ruling party is doing and what is prevalent in the north, in the south, in, for instance, Tamil Nadu, 89% of Tamil Nadu are Hindus. Of them, 70% are backward castes and 20% are Dalits. So from 1925, Periyar, who is the, the founder of politics in Tamil Nadu, his entire narrative is based on reform within Hinduism. Incidentally, the greatest voice for reform within Hinduism and attacks against aspects of Sanatan Dharam was Veer Savarkar, whom the BJP deify. He called them the seven fetters. Now what are the, what is the Tamil version of Hinduism is that it is a great religion, 89%, you know, Tamil Nadu is the repository of Hinduism in many ways. Adi Shankaracharya came from the south. Ramanujan came from the south. The point is that for them, what is Sanatan is not the fossilization of Hinduism, but for social reform within Hinduism, but if you tell them that if you speak in anything against our definition of Sanatan, where everything within it is eternal, you are not a Hindu, then you create a problem which is going to be uh, uh, become worse, dividing the North and the South among Let Hindus. Let Jaggi respond to this. The fact that Hinduism itself has so, so many manifestations and the idea that you pick one Hindutva leaning version and then try and foist it on everyone then creates a pushback because other Hindus who are genuinely Hindus and fully Hindus don't say that this is our Hinduism. They don't associate with it in the same way. Yeah. Uh, I think you have to separate between the reaction in the North which was devastated by two types of colonialisms, especially uh, iconoclastic uh, colonization of from uh, 800 AD to now and uh, to the till the and the south was colonized by the British. So there is a difference between the reaction to uh, Hindu issues in the north because the entire temples were raised and their reaction is much more stronger because of that. In the south, which is actually I think the repository of the older Hinduism, 
the re uh, reaction has been quite different. And the problem, uh, I think I completely disagree with him on Savarkar and Periyar. Savarkar was truly wanting to refer, uh, reform Hinduism. Periyar actually had only anti-Hinduism as his card. He wanted to destroy uh, not just Brahminism, he wanted to destroy the whole of Hinduism. Even today he says, uh, I mean they wanted, they are racists basically. They basically bought into this Aryan Dravidian uh, thing and they are pushing this racist theory of Dravidianism which has no basis in reality. There is no archaeological evidence that Aryans invaded. Definitely tribes came in and went and all those intermarried. But there was no invasion, there was no migration, it may be possible. But they have now created a binary of a racist division in this country which is genetically proved to be wrong. Now, if you want to support this racism and say this is a form of reform, I disagree. Periyar is not nowhere in the same kind of reformist mold as a Savarkar. Let me say what uh, Mr. Jagadathan just said is precisely the danger that I am pointing to. Now, an entire movement of one of the largest states in India where 89% of the people are Hindus is now being interpreted as a kind of racist movement against somebody else's definition of Hinduism. We are coming to a situation where we are compartmentalizing things as per one monolith. And that is a big danger. I mean, today, for instance, I'll tell you, I am a very proud Hindu, but I am the first to admit the need for reform within Hinduism. Recently in a Rajasthan village, a Dalit had the temerity to go for his bridal procession sitting on a horse. He was beaten almost to death by the upper caste. Don't you read the newspapers? So if there is need for reform, if untouchability which was sanctioned or sought to be sanctioned by religion was abolished. Is, there, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Now take gender disparity. There are lines in Manusmriti. Manusmriti is not an entirely, I mean, uh, uh, it has its contradictions, but there is a line in Manusmriti which says that women have no status of their own. I am interpreting it for you. In their birth, ch childhood, they are an accessory of their father. When they are older, they are an accessory of their husband. And if they become a widow, they are an accessory of their son. And we have a great deal of female subordination. That is one of the things Veer Savarkar wrote about. Beti bandi, vevasai bandi, roti bandi. Now, this is something that we need to change. And if you say any attempt to change our definition of how we see Hinduism is tantamount to being anti-Hindu. Just like saying anything in criticism of the government is tantamount to being anti-national. And you should belong to Pakistan. This kind of approach is wrong and is contrary even to the principles of the BJP. I, I was very close with Atal Bihari Bajpayee. And I translated his poems into English on his request. There was still, although he was a committed RSS man, there was a still a certain broadness of vision, of accommodation, of understanding that India's unity which the BJP fights for culturally is basically also dependent on respect for its diversity. That there's lesser respect for diversity much less scope for accommodation, which is also why in a modern political context, the AIDMK has now snapped ties with the BJP. That if what you are saying, and if you view this as being casteist, and an entire movement is being dismissed and decried, then we don't want to be associated with this BJP. No, I think, uh, leave aside the Tamil Nadu politics, Dane, the fact remains... But the Tamil Nadu politics is a reaction to the kind of comments that you made, that they say, we don't want to have anything to do with this. No, no, the ADMK is different from this. The Dravidian movement has basically been anti-Hindu, whether you like it or not, that's the reality. What he says is about, uh, if you actually look at um, all the, and the, you look at Dalit issues, you will find the maximum number of atrocities against Dalit in Tamil Nadu, which is supposedly a repository of reformism, which is not the case. 
uh, anywhere else. Okay, the reform movements have happened in all parts, in all states, in Narayana Guru or whoever it is, uh, Fule and others here and all that. But the fact is, you see the maximum atrocities in Tamil Nadu. Why? And why do you see the why does a state that does not believe in this want to run 45,000 temples? I mean, they have just appropriated it, they have milked it, they are busy making corrupt practices out of it. So this is the, uh, uh, what has happened in the Dravidian model is that they have taken over all the Hindu temples and said, we will decide what is Hinduism. And this is, I mean, how do you support such a thing? You claim you're a secular country and you want to run 45,000 temples and you want to decide how they will be run. I mean, where is the democracy? Where is the secularism in this? And I don't see the Tamil Nadu model. They have definitely done one good thing economically by emphasizing 69% reservation. They've empowered the OBC caste. What they have not done is made the rest of them equal partners. And they've driven out the Brahmins, which is okay if you think that's all right. But the fact is their model of uh, so-called uh, uh, social justice is nowhere near as complete as Savarkar, even though Savarkar you can take Ambraj with him over his formulation of the term Hindutva, where you can have differences, I agree. But as far as Hindu reform is concerned, he was far better than anybody else. I mean, he was more closer to Ambedkar in that and more uh, uh, compared to that, you know. Uh, Ambedkar has praised Savarkar in many ways for trying to do, uh, encourage interdining and uh, intermarriage, all those things. That has not been said about anybody else. You look at what Periyar has been saying about Hinduism and you will be aghast. Uh, I mean, you just take his quotations, you will worry about it. That's not the way to bring social justice, let me be clear. Just to respond, I think in many ways uh, what Mr. Jagannathan is saying repeatedly proves my point. Here we are sitting in Mumbai for an India Today conclave deriding a culture, civilization, tradition and its language which claim to be as ancient as any other in this diverse land as being being critical of their approach to Hinduism, which is a right. Hinduism allows for it. But when you are in power in Delhi and you make that particular definition which you approve of as a kind of national movement as seen as an attack against Hinduism. So let Jaggi respond to this. Big Be weaponizing definitions that even if there are different definitions of Sanatan Dharma as they are in different parts of the country, one definition cannot sought to be the only definition. And everybody there else has a different... versions. And all across the world. And anybody with a different notion then gets brandished as being an anti-national go to Pakistan. No, I completely disagree with this. I don't agree with uh, trying to reduce everything to a single monoculture in India. For the but do you accept that that's an effort that's on? No, it may be on in some parts, it's true. Because the North had a different history from the South. That is different. So that is there. I think it is a short-term phenomenon. Soon, and I'm not speaking on behalf of any government in power in Delhi or any what government. What makes you think it's a short-term phenomenon? I think there is a f phase. I mean, it's like, say, you take feminism. At some point, they may want to do extreme things in order to assert themselves. But after that, they come back to realizing that, okay, we are trying to defend common interests. Now, the key thing about It Hindu could also be the new normal. Not really. It's, it goes up to a certain thing and then it turns back. India has, a, don't forget, we were the guys in 1992, we saw what happened in Ayodhya, right? But we come back to somewhere in the middle right now. So I don't think, uh, and after that we elected uh, Vajpayee, we know what uh, Bal Thakare stood for and we know what um, Aditya Thakare today stands for. It's quite different, right? Bal Thakare was not your uh, so-called consensus building politician. Huh? Right, he had his own street power and he exercised it. So today is not the same thing. So my point is, society tends to swing to an extreme in order to emphasize a point, then comes back to the middle. And the last thing I'd like to say is, see, we are a dharmic nation. What, are we, what do we mean by that? It means an acceptance of plurality. The minute plurality dies, we die. What is happening is Hinduism and all the things associated with Hinduism are not driven by scriptures, unlike 
two uh, uh, ideologies that came from outside which believe in scripture. The British tried to make us focus on scripture and say you are this, Manusmriti is what you should believe in, this is what and your caste system, you have created a Varna system, so everybody has to be fitted into this four castes. These are, uh, what is a fluid system became a rigid system. And th this is the damage done by monocultural ideas that came from the West. Now some parts of Hindu culture are trying to militate against that which is stupid. I disagree with that. But that does not mean that I don't see what is in progress. I mean, Naipaul says we are a wounded civilization. A wounded civilization will overreact in the initial phases and then before it retains a balance. I think we are in that phase where we are shifting a little extreme to the other side. We'll come back to the middle. That's my hope. I hope I'm right. Okay, I'm out of time. You want to make a quick final comment before we end? Final comment. We are in a process of transition. We still have time to take it in the right direction. And if we don't, while I fully support one aspect of what the BJP and the RSS have emphasized, which is to refocus on Bharatiya or Indian civilization, I believe that in their finally implementing it, I am reminded if you may allow end on a couplet, दिल से तो हर मुआमला करके चले थे साफ हम दिल से तो हर मुआमला करके चले थे साफ हम कहने में उनके सामने बात बदल बदल गई एंड दैट इज द डेंजर दैट वी फेस टुडे डू यू हैव अ कपलेट टू काउंटर दैट और आई डोंट हैव आई हैव नो डिपार्टमेंट नहीं है आई हैव नो जगी लाइक ये अपना डिपार्टमेंट नहीं है दिस इज वेयर पवन वर्मा इज इन अ लीग ऑफ हिज ओन so uh, thank you very much for joining us we've had an interesting contest of ideas ultimately which of these two ideas you think is right is something that we leave you to decide uh, and thank you so much pavan varma and jagi for joining us at the inner day conflict thank you sir thank you